So this is a very pre prestigious and vital um, English Catholic Church from the time of the Emancipation. And it's built in the style of a 14th century pre-Reformation church. And, and it was to create an impression of what was lost at the time of the destruction of the Reformation. Our Lady Star of the Sea is my first Catholic church and I was so excited, I almost forgot my bike. Welcome to Our Lady Star of the Sea. I'm Father Kevin Robinson. I'm the priest here for the last 12 years. Uh, this is a very fine church. It was, it's the oldest, I think I'm correct in saying it's the oldest of the Catholic churches in the Archdiocese of Southwark uh, from modern times, in other words, since the re-establishment of the Catholic Church. By the early 1800s, there was such a swell of Catholic people coming from Ireland in particular, looking for work, and they wanted to celebrate their faith and to celebrate their own church. But especially in Greenwich, with the development of the British Empire and international trading and shipping, we had seamen from all other parts of the world dying in the Seamen's Hospital in Greenwich, and they needed a chapel and a place to worship. So very discreetly, from the late 1790s, I think, there was a very discreet chapel unofficially constructed for Catholic people. But, but this, at that point, it was still illegal, technically uh, illegal, or it was... It was overlooked, yes, okay. but it was still on the statutes, for sure. And, 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 the, and the laws weren't repealed until the Catholic Emancipation Acts of 1829. It was only after 1829 that the Catholic Church began to, to um, cautiously um, reorganise itself across the British islands. Th this church is really part integral to that story because there was a maverick priest who was appointed to Greenwich, originally to Deptford, he constructed the little church in Deptford, um, but then he was, he was appointed to Greenwich. In 1845, he, he initiated a project to build uh, a fitting church as a tribute, especially to Catholic seamen who died serving Nelson in the Battle of Trafalgar, and he petitioned the uh, British Admiralty to say, look, you've got faithful Catholic people who've served the best interests of these British islands and they're dying in Greenwich and they deserve to have a church. And he managed to get a significant contribution from the British Admiralty, which was something quite astonishing at the yeah. time, for the British establishment to give funds to create a Catholic church but, in but does that mean they will dip, but does that mean some of the congregation were pensioners from the hospitals? Yes, well, uh, yes, in, 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 the fir in the early stages, yeah. yeah. But then the hospital itself was destroyed when the railway came through Greenwich and um, the railway tunnel was constructed to go under the Queen's house. Because originally the, the, the Greenwich <coughs> railway terminated at Greenwich from Charing Cross. Um, but then it, it was extended down, of course, into Kent. But the original plan had been to put a great viaduct across Greenwich Park immediately behind the Queen's house. Could you imagine that today? Filthy great. I mean, it would have been elegant and beautiful in the time of steam they engines. They knew how to build, but... But um, anyway, that's all part of the story. So this maverick priest who lies in the tomb over here, do you want to come yeah, and see Yeah, yeah, sure. So his name is Richard North. And there's um, a legend surrounding how he came to the priesthood. The story concerning Richard North himself is that when he was a child, he was with his mother and his younger brother in a boat on the Thames, and the, te and the boat capsized, and, uh, and they went into the water. And in the early 1800s, if you fell into the Thames, you didn't worry about drowning because you'd almost certainly catch cholera. Yes. And his mother apparently made a promise that if, if, her two, if, if she and her two sons survived, then they would become priests. Whether they had any choice in the matter, I've got no <laughs> idea. But they were, they, were, they were English. They must have belonged to an English recusant tradition. And they survived. And both the sons became priests. Richard, whose memory is commemorated here Richard North got a little dog at his feet yes a dog at the feet of a of an effigy on a tomb represents faithfulness ah. I don't know if he had a dog but 
but he was a faithful maverick, English Catholic priest. And just look at the... the look at the detail, the yeah. Absolutely this absolutely astonishing detail. This was... Is it all right to somebody, Yeah, this yeah. was uh, somebody called, I think, Farmer. He died in 1860 at the age of 58 years old himself. And then his brother, who was called Joseph, who I think was eight years younger, um, became the second priest. And, um, oh, okay. and they're both actually in the tomb that's in, under the floor here. But he raised the money to construct this church. And in 1845, he had the basic funds together. And he looked for an architect... And he came across a 23, he might have been 24 by that time, a 24-year-old self-styled, self-taught, self-styled architect called William Wardell. Wardell did all the stonework of the building. And then all the money that was raised was lost in a bank which collapsed. And the project kind oh, of went, went on hold. These things happen in finance, they I understand, do. yeah. You can see the emblems around the tomb show these are supposed to be naval pensioners from the Siemens Hospital holding tapers. What's the image here? It's probably Richard North himself. It's Richard North himself offering up the church of Our Lady Star to Our Lady Star of the Sea, the Mother of God. Look, there's a little model of the church. All the money was lost in a bank that collapsed. The stonework had been put up in the 1845, 1846 or 7, I suppose. And then the shell just stood here um, for two or three years. Wardell obviously, you know, spread his wings and moved on to projects elsewhere, other projects in London. Um, and whereas he was a pupil to A.W.N. Pugin, he was now a rival to Pugin himself. <laughs> um, A.W.N. Pugin, who's most famous for building the Houses of Parliament and Big Ben and all mm. of that. The, the interesting thing about both about Wardell and Pugin is that they're both converts from the Church of England, which is why I have a particular affection and sense of attachment to them. Both converts from the Church of England. Wardell was the son of the manager of the Blackwall Workhouse, which would have been on the other side of the river. So he grew up not in a workhouse environment, but, but watching what a workhouse... And, 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 and looking at the destitution. The yeah. yeah. Um, so he obviously trained himself as a so-called architect and put himself under the auspices of A.W.N. Pugin. Pugin was 10 years older than Wardell. Wardell obviously went on to other projects. But meanwhile, Pugin... Pugin was widowed before the age of 21... When he was only 20, his first wife died in childbirth. The child survived and the mother died. He married again in a marriage that wasn't so happy. That marriage lasted for eight years and that wife died. Then he married for a third time and he married into the family of Sir Stuart Nill, who was an aristocratic family on Blackheath. And... Uh, their niece was Jane Nill, and Pugin married the niece of Sir Stuart Nill, who was the first Roman Catholic Lord Mayor of London since Reformation times. And the family obviously brought him down here to see Wardell's work and to look at the empty shell with no roof on it. And then Pugin took the project over, and Pugin put the roof on, and Pugin did all the fixtures and fittings, such as the rude screen. What, what this church really is and I'll put this judiciously, what this church really is, is, um, is a very judicious two fingers to the British establishment. <laughs> because at the time of the Catholic emancipation and the revival of the Catholic Church, there was tremendous resentment towards the return of Catholicism. They portrayed it as, a, as, a, as, a, as an Irish church, as a foreign mission, as the Italian mission. And both Wardell and Pugin are making a very careful statement to say that Catholicism is more English than the English actually remember. So each of these faces here are references to, to English Catholic saints. Can't for sure identify all of them, but here's St. Gregory the Great. You can tell it's a pope because he's got a triple tiara on. Okay. Okay? Gregory the Great sends... Augustine of Canterbury uh -huh. to 
to establish the Catholic Church and to gather up the remains of Celtic Christianity and now organise Christianity officially again across England in 597. You've got various bishops, probably Anselm, probably, probably St Dunstan who wrote the Coronation Oath, You've got St. Bede, who writes the ecclesiastical history in the 700s. You've got lady saints, probably Hilda of Whitby, Julian of Norwich, um, Mildred of Minster. Here, fourth one down, is Edward the Confessor, who okay. lies in Westminster Abbey. King Edmund the Martyr, after whom Edmonton and Bury St. Edmunds is named. Okay. okay. So, so the, the saints around the inner part are all references to English Catholic saints who the English themselves have almost forgotten. And Pugin and Wardell are saying to the British establishment, Catholicism is more English than anything else. Well, well, George is, George is an anachronism. Well, yeah, all, but, all right. Well, but you, about, can't, but, uh, yeah. but you, couldn't, you couldn't not have George, could yeah. you? All right, so he belongs to Greece and <laughs> Armenia and Canada and but, Australia. But he's also as English as it gets, yeah. Well, well he's, <laughs> he's Turkish, really, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, he is. Yeah. Uh, but you couldn't in, have, in a very English you could, way. But you couldn't, you couldn't <laughs> have all these heroes of the crypt without having the patron saint of England. Yeah. Down the middle, down the nave of the church... You have great English saints, and round the edge of the church, you've got ordinary pilgrims representing all the different cultures and nationalities. These are humble pilgrims yeah. representing different cultures, maybe a rabbi, another little princess. Do you, you know what the shell represents on this one? If you've been to the Shrine of Compostela in Spain, right. which is the Shrine of St. James, then you, you wear a shell on your hat. Look, we've got, we've got crusaders. This one looks suspiciously like a rabbi. Why has she got a veil round? There's another one with a shell. I thought one of them had a palm. If you made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, yeah. you were allowed to wear a palm in your hat. And, they were, and so in Chaucer's times, they were called palmers. And Palmer's Green in North London is the place where you would have gathered from all over the UK to set off on the pilgrimage to the Holy Land. That's why Palmer's Green is called Palmer's Green. So what I definitely want to look at is yeah. your, um, uh, your stations. Stations, the yeah. These are quite fine, aren't they? <laughs> yes. We don't actually know who and when they came. It's the story of the Passion, the story of his journey towards Golgotha. The tradition was really brought back by the Crusaders from what they saw in Jerusalem. Christian pilgrims making their way to Jerusalem and then trying to step to walk in the footsteps of Christ between the house of Pontius Pilate and Golgotha, the place of the skull where he was crucified and the Holy Sepulchre Church. Most of it is in the scriptures. It's, uh, I don't want to say it's embroidered, it's expanded by things like that he falls three times. Veronica wipes the face of Jesus. This this is not in the scriptures, but it's such a beautiful element in the story. The name Veronica means true icon. And the story says that a woman in the crowd steps forwards and wipes his face with the, with the scarf from her head. And he, and he leaves the impression of his face. This one is sadly damaged and he's lost his fingers. I think it was in the great, you know, the great storm. But when you look very closely at these images they're sort of halfway between carvings and icons but look at the look at wonderful the, detail yeah he dies on the cross and st john's gospel says that the jews petitioned pilate to say we're having a festival you it's a disgrace to have crucified criminals and pilate said well they won't be dead yet so they break the legs of their too crucified with him so they suffocate they can't take their weight off their lungs anymore but when they come to Christ he's already, he's already dead. dead one of the soldiers pierces his side with a lance and out of his side flows blood and water they're really dramatic yeah when these modernizations I mean that was the big thing in the 60s you covered everything up with hardboard didn't you you can see where the heat 
the heat uh, convection has deposited dust and shows the and shows the framework behind as if it's transparent. That that is actually a canvas painting of of Christ seated in judgment and oh, with, abo above the arch. Yes, I yes. see. But if I take you back into this little chapel, how this survived, I don't know, because this ceiling has survived almost intact. And I can imagine someone standing here with a pitchfork. Oh, I didn't see this. Yes. <laughs> I can imagine somebody standing here with a pitchfork saying, you are not coming in here. You are not coming here with a bucket of brown paint. 